Hi, welcome back to today's movie recap. For today's movie, we will recap a movie franchise called Dune, Part 1 and Dune, Part 2. Spoilers ahead, so watch out and enjoy. Arrakis, also known as Dune, is a deadly and nearly inhospitable desert planet. Arrakis is considered the most important planet by outsiders due to it being the only source of the psychedelic drug called Melange, commonly known as Spice, which is the most valuable psychotropic substance that can be found in the sands of Arrakis and can give whoever ingests it heightened vitality and awareness. Spice is the key to interstellar travel, it allows guild navigators to successfully navigate space and guide starships called Hayliners in traversing space safely and instantly. Because of the spice, Arrakis attracted the attention of the outsiders who were vying for spice. Arrakis was occupied by House Harkonnen, and the sieges, or patriarchal tribes living in Arrakis called the Freeman watched as the outsiders ravaged their lands in front of their very eyes. In the year 10191 in Kaladin, homeworld of House Atreides, the Padisha Emperor Shad Am IV of House Carino had come to announce that the House Atreides had been given control over Arrakis and was assigned to serve as the desert planet's new fiefholder. Duke Leto Atreides stepped forward, accepting the privilege given to them and sealing the agreement. The heir of House Atreides, Paul, went to the hangar and welcomed Duncan, a high-profile warden serving House Atreides. Wardens are the name used to refer to the House Atreides soldiers. Paul asked Duncan to take him with them when they go to Arrakis for a scout mission. Paul had been having strange dreams of Arrakis and the Freeman, mostly an unknown female Freeman. Paul dreamt of Duncan dying in the Arrakis, and he feels like his dream wouldn't happen if he came with the wardens. But Duncan refused to take him as it was not only going to put him in trouble with the Duke, it was also going to be dangerous for the young heir. Paul came to ask his father about it, but just like Duncan, Duke Leto also refused to let him go with the wardens to Arrakis. So instead of coming, Paul decided to stay and train with another high-profile warden, Gurney Halleck. In GD Prime, the homeworld of House Harkonnen, Glossa Rabin Harkonnen, the Harkonnen leader of Arrakis who used to oversee the Harkon Spice operation on the desert planet, had returned to his own homeworld and reported to Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, head of House Harkonnen. The Harkonnen are plotting something to retake Arrakis from House Atreides. Back in Kaladin, among the people who had visited House Atreides was the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohayim who demanded to see Paul after hearing of his dreams. Lady Jessica, Paul's mother, introduced Gaius Helen Mohayim to Paul as her teacher at the Bene Gesserit School, who is now the truthsayer to the Emperor. Before entering the room the Reverend Mother is in, Dr. Yu came to check Paul's vital signs. While checking on Paul, Dr. Yu spoke to him in a language Paul couldn't understand. Afterward, Paul entered the room and met the Reverend Mother. The Reverend Mother commanded Paul to kneel in front of her, using the voice, a unique ability that allows the Bene Gesserit to take over someone else's mind and make them do things they tell them to. The Reverend Mother threatens to kill Paul if he doesn't put his hand in the box, and Paul sits there with his hand inside the box, grunting as the box spreads pain all over his body. After the short time of torture, the Reverend Mother told Paul that she would have killed him if Paul had been unable to control his impulses. She stated that Paul has more than one birthright, he inherited too much power just because he was the son of Lady Jessica, who had been training him along the way. Lady Jessica assisted the Reverend Mother back to their ship and Gaius Helen Mohayim chastised Lady Jessica for having a son instead of a daughter. Bene Gesserit is an exclusive sisterhood and in accordance with their long breeding program, Lady Jessica was instructed to bear a daughter whose son would become the legendary Bene Gesserit and messianic super being named Kwisatz Haderach, which is an old Chikopsa term that means shortening of the way. But instead of a daughter, Lady Jessica bore a son, and that is Paul. After the Reverend Mother had left, Lady Jessica was shocked to see that Paul had overheard everything she and the Reverend Mother talked about. Duke Leto had traveled to Arrakis with Lady Jessica and Paul, who ran to greet the Fur Hawat with a short hug. Paul follows his family to the Ornithophers, watching the people of Arrakis in curiosity as the crowd chants the words Lisan al Gabe, which translates to voice from the outer world and is the Arrakis name for Messiah. It seems the Reverend Mother had already gone to visit Arrakis before, which was the reason for the people of Arrakis to have superstition. While traveling to the city of Arakeen, Thufir explained that the city is surrounded by a shield wall to protect it from the weather and the worms that lurk in the sand. Lady Jessica then studied the lined-up women to choose a housekeeper and chose the housekeeper named Shadout Mapes, a woman. Shadout handed Lady Jessica a dagger, which she calls the Tooth of Shilhulid, the master the Freeman are worshipping. Meanwhile, Paul was studying about the Arrakis and Freeman in his room when a small insect made a hole in the wall and flew into his room. The insect tried to attack him, but Paul caught it with his hand and realized it was a hunter-seeker, which means its operator must be nearby. Duke Leto found the dead operator and was furious that someone had sneaked in to try and take the life of his son. 
He ordered the Ferhawa to find and capture spies. The Reverend Mother is in a meeting with Vladimir and it is revealed that they have been planning on eliminating the members of House Atriides in Arrakis. The Reverend Mother demanded that Vladimir not kill Paul and Lady Jessica as they are under the protection of the Bene Gesserit. Vladimir promised to not harm them, but as soon as the Reverend Mother had left, he declared that no Atriides would live, not even Paul and Lady Jessica. During a meeting, Thufir Hawat informed the Duke that he had secured a copy of the Harkonnens' account books. The Harkonnens were taking 10 billion Solaris out of Arrakis every year and leaving Arakeen with almost nothing. While they were checking the spice silos, Duncan returned with the advance team and Paul ran to hug him in excitement. Duncan had managed to make peace with the Siege and was able to get the leader of the Siege, Stilgar, to visit Arakeen. Stilgar showed his distaste for the outsiders as he believes they are only planning on taking the spice and leaving the freemen with nothing. Duke Leto explained that he had been given Arrakis as his fief to rule and protect, and he promised that the Freeman would never be hunted while he governed the Arakeen. Stilgar accepted it, and before he left, he mumbled about recognizing Paul in Shikapsa. Later on, Duncan showed them all the things he got from the Freeman, and Paul realized Duncan admired the Freeman. The next day, Atriides met Dr. Kynes, who, upon noticing that Paul had worn the still suit correctly on his own, was astonished. In Chikopsa, she mumbled about the one knowing the ways of the Freeman even when he was not born to them. The group rode the Ornithophers to check outside the shield wall and saw one of the spice harvesters. They also saw a giant worm from a distance. Worms live deep in the sands and get closer to the surface when they want to attack. The desert is their territory and whoever walks on the sand risks getting eaten by worms. A docking sequence was initiated as a carryall held the spice harvester with the anchors to carry it and protect it from the giant worm approaching. But one of the anchors failed and Duke Leto went down to save the crew members in the Spice Harvester. Paul stepped out of the Ornithophers to help, but a vision immobilized him and he could hear an eerie voice mumbling about the Quisit's Hatterack awakening. Paul stayed kneeling beside the Spice Harvesters and Gurney had to come and drag him back to the Ornithophers to save him from the giant worm. Once they reached Arakeen, Duke Leto reprimanded Paul and the latter apologized before going back to his room where he was checked by Dr. Yu. Paul remembered the vision he had, the vision of the unknown woman kissing him and then stabbing him with a blade he believes to be important. Lady Jessica asked Paul what he saw and was shocked when Paul claimed he knew she was pregnant. Lady Jessica cried as she returned to her shared room with Duke Leto. She wanted to talk to Duke Leto about their son, but Duke Leto refused as he knew already what Lady Jessica wanted to talk about. Duke Leto asked Lady Jessica, not as Paul's mother but as a Bene Gesserit, to protect Paul. Later that night, while everyone was asleep, Duke Leto noticed something and called for security, but no one was answering him. He approached what seemed to be a body on the ground but was decapitated by Dr. Yu, who had betrayed him in order to save his wife. The Harkonnens had attacked Arakeen and killed most of the wardens. Dr. Yu, not wanting to betray Duke Leto in the first place, decided to replace Duke Leto's peg tooth with a device. If Duke Leto bites down hard, the fake tooth will be crushed. Once he breathes out, the air will be filled with poison and it will kill everyone in the room. This is a chance given to Duke Leto to kill the Baron, which, in turn, would take his life too. In the meeting room, Duke Leto was stripped of his clothing as he lay there, unmoving. Dr. Yu's betrayal to save his wife had been futile as he was killed by Vladimir, who told Duke Leto that his wife and son were dead. Duke Leto muttered something under his breath, causing Vladimir to lean closer to hear better. Then Duke Leto crushed the fake tooth and breathed out, filling the air with poison that killed all the Harkonnens inside the room except for Vladimir, who had been taken back to the GD Prime and healed. Meanwhile, Paul and Lady Jessica were captured and brought into an ornithopher. They covered Lady Jessica's mouth to prevent her from using the voice but failed to realize that Paul had the same ability as his mother. Paul used the voice and ordered the Harkonnen to remove Lady Jessica's gag, and as soon as the gag was removed, Lady Jessica ordered the Harkonnen to kill his own ally and set them free. The Harkonnens in the Thopters were killed, but the ship was also crippled and they found themselves in the desert, seeing the destruction in Akarin. They stayed in the Ornithopher for a while, and when Paul found his father's ring wrapped in a cloth, they knew that he was gone. Paul had another vision, and this one was much clearer as he saw a huge war breaking out in his name. Lady Jessica cried as she watched her son suffer because of the vision along with the pain of losing Duke Leto. Lady Jessica embraced her son and comforted him. They stayed in the Ornithopher until Paul felt something was coming for them. They crawled out of the Ornithopher that had been buried by the sand and saw another Ornithopher driven by Duncan. Duncan was with Dr. Kynes and throughout the ride, Duncan explained that it was not only the Harkonnens who came to attack them but also the Sardaukers, the elite military force of the Padisha Emperor. Dr. Kynes brought the others to an underground shelter where they will be staying for a few hours just to let the storm pass. 
but the Harkonnens and Sardaukers had found them and killed everyone in the vicinity. Duncan chose to sacrifice himself to protect Paul and Lady Jessica, while Dr. Kynes led the Atriides through a secret passage to escape. Halfway through the passage, Dr. Kynes told Paul and Lady Jessica to use the Thopter outside and head south where they could find the Freeman, while she decided to go to another station and report what happened to the Landsrat. But Dr. Kynes didn't have any rides and was eventually caught. The Sardaukers surrounded her and Dr. Kynes thumped the ground, attracting the attention of the giant worm who ate them all up. Paul and Lady Jessica, on the other hand, had used the fog to escape from the Sardaukers chasing them. Escaping from the Sardaukers was a success, but their helicopter received great damage and they crashed into the desert. They stood on top of a rock formation and changed into their still suits. Using the visions he had seen, Paul determined where the Freeman was and they waited for the sun to come down so they could walk on the sand. They imitated the Freeman sandwalk to avoid being detected by the giant worm, but just as they were nearing another rock formation, Paul accidentally stepped on the drum sand, which the giant worm heard. They were chased, and before Paul could be attacked by the worm, a thumper was heard and the giant worm stayed still for a while before leaving. Standing on a rock formation, Paul and Lady Jessica found that they were not alone. The men they were looking for surrounded them and Stilgar recognized Paul. He decided Paul could come with them but deemed Lady Jessica to be a weakling and planned to kill her. But Lady Jessica proved that she's not weak and Stilgar decided to spare her. Paul, who was sitting atop it, was surprised when a voice spoke from behind him. Turning around, he finally met the girl he had been having visions with and learned that the girl's name is Cheney. Even though Stilgar had decided to let Paul and Lady Jessica come with them, one of the Freeman, Jamies, refused to let them come without them proving themselves to him. Paul accepted his challenge and everyone watched as the two engaged in a competition where the death of the opponent was the only way to win. Paul used the blade Cheney gave her before the fight and had already won against Jamie's, but he refused to kill the Freeman as it was something he had never done before. Jamie's only grew angrier and the fight continued. When Paul had another vision and heard the name of Kwisatz Haderach, it was as if something possessed him and he killed Jamie's with one slice, regretting it afterwards. Lady Jessica wanted Stilgar to help them leave the planet at first, but with Paul's persuasion, they decided to come with the Freeman to Siege Tabor. Their journey to Siege Tabor began the next day, and Paul was amazed to see desert power. Cheney told him that it was only the beginning, and Paul watched as the sun illuminated her smiling face, just like in his previous visions. Dune Part 2 Start With Paul Atriides and his mother, Lady Jessica, join Cheney and the Freeman on their journey as he seeks revenge against the conspirators who killed his father and destroyed House Atriides. In her imperial diary in 10191, Princess Irulan Carino shared the aftermath of the sudden battle for Arrakis. The battle that caused the fall of House Atriides took everyone by surprise. Glossy Rabin became the new ruler of Arrakis. Emperor Shaddam IV, the father of Princess Irulan Carino, was dispirited and was unable to speak after hearing the news of the House Atriides being no more. Both the Emperor and the Princess were never the same after the battle, for they treated Duke Leto as a family. Asleep on the sand, Paul woke up to find himself ambushed by Harkonnens. Paul, Jessica, and the Freeman hid around the rock formation and used the thumper to call on the worms. The Harkonnens flew up the rock formation and looked around for any sign of the giant sand creature. With their guards down, the Freeman quickly eliminated the Harkonnens one by one. Paul killed one Harkonnen and was about to get shot by another if not for Lady Jessica, who killed the Harkonnen. The Freeman gathered everything they could get from the dead Harkonnens and set off to continue their journey to Siege Tabor, leaving a triggered thumper for the worm to eat the remains of the Harkonnens. After traveling for a while, the troop reached Siege Tabor and Stilgar talked to one of the men guarding the siege. The Freeman guard didn't trust Paul and Jessica but still let them in as they were with Stilgar. There was a ruckus inside the Siege Tabor as Stilgar's troop came in with Paul and Jessica. Some of the men were mourning over Jamie's, whom Paul had killed during a fair fight, while others showed their anger toward the two foreigners. Some of the freemen accused Paul and Jessica of being spies, while others chanted the name Lisan Algabe, believing that Paul and Jessica are the mother and son that the prophecy was talking about that will bring prosperity to Arrakis. Stilgar talked to the leaders of the siege about Paul and pledged his life for the young Atriides, convincing the leaders to accept Paul and let him learn the ways of the freemen. Stilgar then called for Jessica and led her to a sacred well of water taken from the bodies of the fallen freemen. He told Jessica about Lisan Algabe, whom they believe will bring back the trees and green paradise to Arrakis. Stilgar believes that Paul is the prophet and Jessica is the mother of Lisan Algabe. He told Jessica that the freemen's reverend mother was dying and they wanted Jessica to become the next reverend mother. If Jessica refused, she would have to return her water to the sacred well, which means death, so Jessica had no choice but to agree. 
During the ritual, Jessica sat in front of the dying Reverend Mother and drank the water of life, which is a deadly poison that can be fatal for males and the untrained. Jessica started shaking violently and she gasped for air as the poison was being transmuted with memories of all the female ancestors in her genetic lineage being passed on to her. After a while, Jessica's now blue eyes flew open while the Reverend Mother became the one gasping for air. The Reverend Mother discovered that Jessica was pregnant, which caused worry among the women surrounding them. The ritual was a success and an unconscious Jessica was laid outside where the divided women were arguing. Stilgar believed that Jessica truly was the mother of Lisan Algabe and now she has survived the holy poison, which means that the prophecy has been accomplished. Meanwhile, Cheney and those who were with her believed that the Mahdi should be a woman and the Arrakis should only be saved by their own people. Cheney argued that Jessica surviving the holy poison was no miracle and Paul agreed, effectively silencing the shouting Freeman. He explained that Jessica is an advanced Bene Gesserit, so she is trained in poison transmutation. Paul made a speech about not wanting to lead the Freeman nor seek power, he only wanted to learn the ways of the Freeman and fight alongside them, which earned respect from Cheney. When Jessica woke up, she talked to Paul and revealed that her daughter inside her womb was talking to her. After the poison transmutation, the water of life awakened the mind of Jessica's daughter before it was even born. When she started conversing with her baby, Jessica started believing that Paul was indeed the Mahdi and that he should also drink the water of life so he could finally see. She became obsessed with the idea of convincing the non-believers that the prophecy was true and she decided to start with the weak-minded. On Paul's first day of training, Stilgar claimed that to be one of them, the first thing Paul must learn was to be one with the desert. Paul was sent into the desert alone for his training. A worried Cheney followed Paul into the desert to help him and taught him how to do the Freeman Sand walk properly. Paul soon joined the Fidakin fighters with Cheney and helped in raiding Harkonnen spice harvesters. He grew closer to the Freeman and even earned the nicknames Muad'Dib and Yusul. But with Cheney, it was different as instead of friendship, love blossomed between the two of them and soon they became a couple. For his last training, Paul had to learn how to ride a sandworm and the Freeman anxiously watched when they realized that Paul had managed to call upon the biggest sandworm. Paul proved that he is indeed unremarkable as he successfully rode the biggest sandworm and Cheney watched as everyone went down on their knees to worship Paul. While Paul was busy learning the ways of the Freeman, Jessica had become a prominent figure in a religion that believed in Paul being the prophet. Once she was done changing the minds of the non-believers in North Arrakis, Jessica decided to head south to spread the words of the prophecy. Before she leaves, Paul expresses his disappointment in his mother's obsession. As he watched his mother walk away, Paul was reminded of the vision he had. The vision of Jessica walking amidst the people of Arrakis starving to death as they call upon his name. Paul stayed in the north to continue his fight against the Harkonnens. Glossy Rabin, who was staying at Spice Depot in Arrakis, was furious when they were suddenly attacked. He was already losing grip on the spice production because of the Freeman, and with their weakened state, they were ambushed by the Freeman led by Paul, whom they now know as Muad'Dib, the prophet. Upon seeing Muad'Dib's silhouette in the fog, Glossy Rabin felt fear for his life and escaped. Princess Irulan believes that Muad'Dib the Prophet shouldn't be taken lightly and while walking with Reverend Mother Gaius Mohayim, she kept wondering who Muad'Dib really is until an idea formed in her head that Paul might still be alive. Reverend Mother Gaius Mohayim told Princess Irulan that if Paul was really alive, then he likely knew the truth. Emperor Shad Amphor was the one behind the liquidation of House Atriides and if word about it got out, he would most likely lose the throne. Their remaining hope is Phaedritha, the Baron's psychopathic nephew. So to secure the genes of their prospect, the Reverend Mother sent Margot Fenrig, a Bene Gesserit acolyte, to seduce Fate so they could learn how to control him. Paul and the Fidakin fighters ambushed a group of smugglers and he stopped the fight from escalating even more once he discovered that Gurney Halleck was still alive and had joined the smugglers. The two happily hugged each other, and when Gurney learned that Puel was preparing for a war against the Harkonnens, he told him about the House Atriides' atomic warheads the late Duke Leto had hidden in a cave somewhere in Arrakis. With Cheney and Stilgar, Paul followed Gurney as he led them to the cave. At the south, Jessica demanded to get Water of Life so she could make Paul drink it. She learned that the Water of Life came from an adolescent sandworm. She watched as an adolescent sandworm was caught and drowned. Then a liquid was excreted by the drowned sandworm and that liquid was the Water of Life. Paul had a dream of Cheney dying and when he woke up, he felt the fear of that dream happening when he heard rumbles and explosions. He went out and ran to Cheney who seemed afraid of what she was seeing. There, Paul realized that Siege Tabor was being attacked. After the attack, the Freemen learned that the Harkonnens were coming and they had to go south. Cheney and most of the Freemen prepared to head south, but Paul was hesitant as he had foreseen a holy war happening if he went south. But the war had made choices for them and after Cheney's reassurance, Paul agreed to head south. 
When Fade came to search the destroyed Siege Tabor, he only found Shashakli, Cheney's friend, and killed her. On their journey to the south, Cheney noticed Paul heading somewhere else. Paul had gone to the temple and consumed the water of life, killing him for a while. When Cheney found him, she was enraged and demanded that Jessica fix him. Using the voice, Jessica controlled Cheney and, against the latter's wishes, made her pour a drop of water of life into Paul's mouth, awakening Paul. Paul was told by the Freeman leaders to challenge Stilgar to a duel and kill him so he could steal his leadership, but Paul refused to do so. Paul declared that none of the Freeman could stand against him, causing everyone, including Cheney, to get angry. But Paul ignored their anger and continued his speech. He talked about how every Freeman's mother warned them about the prophet that would soon come to save Arrakis. He then approached a Freeman, talking about an incident that happened to the Freeman's mother way back then and about the time when Arrakis used to have a Freeman named Dune. The moment those words came out of his mouth, all the men went down on their knees for him, Lisan Algabe. Chaney was the only one who wanted to remain standing as she watched her love turn into someone else, but Gurney pulled her down. The Emperor and Princess Irulan had reached Arakeen's stronghold fortress and ordered the Baron to investigate the South. When the Baron disagreed, he was attacked from behind as the Emperor demanded that he find Muad'Dib. Unbeknownst to them, the Prophet had come to wreak havoc. Paul attacked the stronghold fortress with the atomic warheads and following the warheads were the giant sandworms. A war ensued between the Freeman and the Sardaukar forces while the Emperor and the Baron stayed inside. Everyone inside watched as Muad'Dib entered the room to kill the Baron. Muad'Dib approached the Emperor, but the Sardaukar elites blocked him. Speaking in Chikapsa, Muad'Dib ordered the Freeman to bring the Emperor and the others to the residence. Gurney Halleck stayed outside fighting against the Sardaukar soldiers and he prevented Glossy Rabin from fleeing. The two faced off against each other, but Glossy Rabin soon met his demise at the hands of Gurney Halleck. In the residency, Reverend Mother Gaius Mohayim was confused when she realized that Jessica was there and had become the Reverend Mother of the Freeman and a religious leader. And to Princess Irulan's shock, Muad'Dib the Prophet was actually Paul Adriides. The Emperor claimed that the Great Houses would come after Paul, but the latter just ordered Gurney to send a warning to the Great Houses that if they came to attack, the House Atriides' atomic warheads would obliterate Spice forever. Reverend Mother Gaius Mohayim tried to speak up, but Paul used his voice to silence everyone. Paul demanded the Imperial Throne, but the Emperor refused to give it up. So Paul gave an ultimatum. He would be married to Princess Irulan so she could be safe as they rule the Empire together, but the Emperor will have to answer for his father. Fade stepped in and challenged Paul to a duel using the Emperor's blade. Fade was able to stab Paul with the blade but ultimately lost when Paul killed him. Paul reached out his hand and silently ordered the Emperor to kneel down and kiss his hand. The Emperor relented and everyone kneeled for Lee San and Gabe as a sign of worship. Paul looked at Cheney and watched in resignation as Cheney walked away with her heart broken by the promises Paul didn't keep. Gurney informed Paul that the Great Houses refused to honor Paul's ascendancy and Paul ordered his Freeman army to bring them to paradise. Paul's unborn sister, Alia, asked their mother what was happening and when Jessica told her, they muttered that Muad'Dib's holy war had begun. Meanwhile, Cheney had called for a sandworm and prepared to mount it so she could finally go somewhere else. 